Hey guys, so happy to be here on the other side of my first Boston Marathon. If you don't know, I was chasing this dream for four years. Back in 2018 is when I first got that idea in my mind that I could make it to Boston with consistency and hard work over time that I could achieve it. So it was an amazing day out there. Excited to give you guys a recap and hopefully I can do the day justice exactly as it really went down. So if you watched my training videos, it was really pretty much a perfect training cycle. I really didn't have any missed days, no sicknesses. The weather was really on my side. The taper was going well. And the week before the race, the world kind of had other plans for me threw a little bit of a wrench, but here I am. I did finish, but I do want to kind of talk about starting there the week before because that played a part in just how I was kind of feeling and the goals I had originally set and how I felt about that. So the Wednesday night before the race, which the Boston Marathon is on a Monday. So Wednesday, my daughter had been sick with kind of a stomach bug, but she hadn't thrown up or anything else. Just really not feeling very good, but I didn't think too much of it. And then I started feeling a little bit yucky on that Wednesday night. And that Wednesday night, I basically ended up spending the entire night throwing up. It was absolutely terrible. I have not had anything beyond cold symptoms since before COVID. So I basically have not been what I would refer to as sick in at least two years. And here we are half a week before the Boston Marathon and I'm throwing up. So basically my entire hydration, nutrition, nutrition, resting plan from that last week of taper, which is really what you need to be focusing on, went out the window. I was supposed to do my last quality session on that Thursday and I missed that. So I just wasn't really feeling that great about things that Thursday. I was done throwing up, but pretty much spent the entire day in bed recuperating, really couldn't move much. I was trying my best to drink Gatorade, uh, electrolyte drinks, water, you know, get down any sort of basic carbs that I could. And really my fear at that point was I knew I was over it and that I would be okay. You know, I didn't know how it might affect my race, but I wasn't really worried about that. I was worried about my kids getting it because it seems like usually once we have any sort of stomach bug in our house, it flies through the entire house. My, you know, 3.30 goal was still there. I never dropped that, but at the same time, it was really just all about, I just need to get my family to Boston and get to that start line feeling healthy and having my family healthy there to watch me. And so I was just feeling a whole bunch of relief by the time Saturday rolled around and we were getting on that plane. At that point, I just thought, you know what? My family is here and my parents were there already as well. Anything beyond that is really just gravy. Like whatever happens at the race, I will give up my all, but my family is here. I am so lucky and so grateful to even just have the opportunity that that is all that matters. And honestly, you know, I, I don't know how much all of that like throwing up and trying to like rehydrate and all of those things and get my nutrition back in those few days how that would have affected monday's race i don't know and if there i'm not making any sort of excuses whatsoever i just feel like you know in any race that you do especially the marathon you have to un expect the unexpected there's always a curveball so all i could control at that point was however i feel on the day like i'll just go for it and we'll see what happens so we're in Boston, um, everyone's feeling good. Saturday, we just had dinner, and then Sunday was gonna be the expo day, basically, and tried to keep the walking to a minimum. But I did wanna get out for a shakeout run, and I really was just lacking confidence a lot at that point. So my husband and I went out for a shakeout run. The weather was absolutely gorgeous that morning, and, and I had been thinking about this particular runner her name is Heather Jensen. Try and Run Girl is her handle on Instagram. And she's someone I listened to on a podcast in 2018. And she was just kind of one of the people that really inspired me to start going for Boston because it took her all of this time to qualify. She had run a lot of marathons, not qualifying. And it wasn't like she was just naturally gifted as a runner and ran in college and all of those things. I mean, she had to work really hard for it. And she was super consistent. And I think that that's when I kind of realized that you know, Boston isn't only for people who are just naturally talented runners or grew up running or something like that. Um, that really, you know, if you're willing to work incredibly hard for the opportunity, you'll get there. You can achieve it. It's doable. And so she just really inspired me. 
And I had thought about, if I see her, I'm gonna say something. And I saw her, I saw her right at the Boston Marathon finish line the day before at the shakeout run. And I went up to her and I just told her how she had inspired me. And that is really when it hit me, how big of a deal it was. And that I was really here at the Boston Marathon, that it was gonna happen. Started crying, she was crying with me. And I was just so happy that I was able to share that with her. Um, I know she's probably had an influence on a lot of people's lives and I'm just one person, but I, I wanted to tell her that. And something that happened really cool the night before my race, I got a message from the, like a random woman who had watched my YouTube channel. She messaged me on Instagram and had just said like how much I inspired her to run her first marathon. And I just really hung on to that. And it was just really special to hear, especially when I had just shared that morning with someone who had really inspired me. So it was just a really great day all around and went to the expo. I'm not a big expo person. If you are, it's a great one. And I would suggest go an earlier day other than Sunday because it was very busy, very crowded. Waited in line for a couple pictures. Um, some of the merchandise was picked over. So we didn't really just spend a lot of time there. I just, you know, didn't want to spend a lot of time in the crowds and stuff. But for people who really like the expo, it's absolutely a good one. And yeah, went to dinner, an early dinner. It was good. I ate pretty light. I'd been eating tons of carbs, you know, all day. It kept dinner fairly light and then went to bed, went to bed early. And the nice thing about the Boston Marathon and also the hard thing that you're not used to is it has a very late start. And so I've had to get up for marathons at like 3.30 in the morning. This was not the case for this one. I had to be on the buses at 8.15. And so I just got up at a very normal time, although I was awake since like 3.34 in the morning. So here's the thing, I left in plenty of time to get on the bus by 8.15, needed to drop my bag. The weather was so pretty, it was so nice. Um, I didn't even, I wasn't wearing gloves, I wasn't wearing an ear cover or anything. I was wearing long sleeves. I had like my throwaway layers on, but I just felt super comfortable. And then walked along the road. I'm just very calm, knowing I have plenty of time, drop my bag, and then we start walking to the buses. And that's when I realize, wow, it is very crowded. This is not like CIM, which has like 7,000 runners. Boston has 30,000. And that was sort of my aha moment, like, okay, I probably needed to leave sooner, but I still wasn't feeling worried because I'm looking around and lots of blue bins, lots of people in my wave. And so I was never concerned about, you know, not getting to start or getting there and them saying, nope, you're too late, sorry, you can't race. It wasn't an issue of that. I mean, it was just like, okay, just be calm. You'll get there when you get there. Just you're here and that's all that matters. So I, timing, I'm not sure. We probably waited at least like 30, 45 minutes to just get on the bus from that time. Got on the bus and talked to a wonderful lady and my, as my bus mate and just enjoy the ride and the scenery and all that. Still feeling good, eating along the way and just knowing that I need to, to take in enough nutrition that morning because we're starting late. So my wave was going off at 10.50. So then we get to the Athletes Village pull up and kind of look at my clock like, okay, we have enough time. And then the porta potty lines were super, super long. So that was the first thing I did was go get in line. Uh, looking back now, there were porta potties in other spots. And so that is what I would do differently next year is not just like go with the herd and go to the long lines, but take a minute to kind of look around and see where some better options would be. There's tons of people. I'm just asking where to start. Okay, go that way. So I start walking that way, thinking the start's going to be past that. Then we're walking again. Then I'm realizing like, oh yeah, we have to walk a pretty far ways to actually get to the start. Looking at my watch, I'm like, okay, it's not 10.50 yet. Yes, there's some blue bibs around. It's gonna be fine. Don't worry. Did text my husband because I said, I am. I think this is gonna be the first marathon where I have to stop and pee because even though I just peed, I need to pee like right before I start racing. Um, but luckily there were porta potties near the start. So those did not have lines. So I'm like, okay, I'm gonna go. It's fine. I know I'm running a little bit behind. Then all of these yellow wave people are crowded around and they're saying that blue can, if you can get through, you can squish through. So I'm like squishing, squishing, you know, trying to like weave my way to the start since my wave was already up there. And that's kind of when I start to realize, okay, blue wave already left and here I am and I got to get there. And there were people running, blue wave runners running to the start. And I'm like, I refuse to do that. It'll start when I start, you know, I'm just gonna stay calm. So I get up there and I 
like start finally doing my warm up stretches. I still hadn't, I had kind of done a little bit when I was in line for the bathroom, but I hadn't done like my full routine. So I start to do the stretches and the, one of the officials says like me and a couple of people who are standing there, like, if you're going to go, go now. <laughs> like they're about to start the yellow waves and have them come through. So I'm like, okay, I got to go. So that was it. I kind of just took a deep breath, started my watch and started through the start line. So here we go. As I'm starting, the kind of nice thing with starting late was that there was no one in front of me. I start out like smooth and it's downhill, but then all of a sudden I'm looking ahead and now I'm thinking, okay, I was like an early blue wave runner and I'm behind the entire blue wave because there were different corrals within the blue waves and I'm behind all them, which means my goal is going to be faster than the goal that those people have most likely or at least most of them. Yeah, sure enough, I come up on them and then it's basically like I'm breaking and I have to make a decision at that point. Am I, you know, gonna weave around them? Am I just gonna stay behind them? And so really it was sort of a little bit of both. I had to just kind of go with it and weave when it felt right or find spaces. I mean, there were certain points where it was like, there was no space to get through. And it really was like that for the first several miles. And so that is at the point where I kind of was like, okay, my pacing strategy needs to be different here because I'm going to end up with a slow first couple of miles, not because I am trying to do these exact times, but because I really can't go any faster based on the situation here. And I don't want to do too much weaving. Looking back, I probably did more than I should. I probably should have just calmed down and not worried about it. But I was having some anxiety then about that at that point. Plus, it was very crowded and that is just hard for me. Like I said, this is by far the biggest race I've ever been to. I'm used to some of these small races where you have complete openings in front of you to go where you need. And I'm a little bit of a claustrophobic person, so I was just kind of feeling that. And that was hard for me. I had decided not to take my music with me. Looking back now, I really think I needed my music for probably the first eight to 10 miles, just because that was a time where I just wanted to feel relaxed. Um, the reason I didn't take it is because I wanted to take in the course and know that this was such a big day. But for me, I think it would have helped me mentally with having all those people around to just kind of be in a zone, listen to music, relax. So I think I will probably do that next year. I have Aeropex headphones. They're really easy to turn off and still hear what's around you. And so I just wish I would have had them, I think. So yeah, that was basically the first 10 miles. Um, there were tons of spectators the entire time. I want to say there were water and Gatorade stations like every mile, mile, mile and a half. So I would take water at most of them, but I also had my nutrition on me. So I had Huma gels and I had water and I had Tailwind in a water bottle as well. So I would sit for my own water during that time. So coming along like miles 10, 10 to 15, that's where I knew that I needed to kind of focus on picking up the pace a little bit. The crowds did start thinning out at that point. I felt more comfortable. Before that, I felt like I could never really get into any sort of rhythm with pacing. That part I think was really the hardest of, of the whole race. But I did feel like I was able to get into a rhythm at that point, that kind of 10 to 15. Um, I was feeling good for the most part. Really from the very beginning of the race, I had cramping in my calves, which I did feel some of that at CIM, but it went away. This did not go away pretty much the whole time. I had two salt tablets, which I don't remember exactly the mileage, but I took those at different stages just to kind of keep at bay any sort of major cramping. I think that always really helps. And whether it does or doesn't, at least in my mind, it's just good to do it just in case. It certainly not, doesn't hurt to have that extra salt. And so I did take those, but that was something that was kind of uncomfortable, but nothing that I couldn't work through is more just like, okay, how is this gonna hold up when I get into those late hill miles? It was fine at that point in time. Uh, I was taking a gel about every 40 minutes and I felt pretty good about my nutrition. Uh, talk about it at the end, but I think I probably would have taken one more gel closer to the end. But otherwise, I felt, felt really good about that. Uh, stomach was feeling good. 
And just overall, I did feel good. I, I knew I was not on target by any means to get the 330 goal pace, and I had kind of let that go at that point. I was okay with not getting the 330. I still kind of had my eyes set on a PR at that point, which would be 333. Um, but I knew I was just way behind just from the, the tougher start and just my calves. I didn't want to overdo it too early. I was trying to be conservative and I was trying to be patient. So I thought I did good, a good job of that, but I came in at the halfway point at 147 something. So it was actually a little bit faster than the halfway in CIM, but definitely a couple of minutes slower than I had planned on with that 330 time goal. So I got a text from my husband about this time saying my family would be at mile 17. They had gone back and forth on whether they were just gonna see me at the end because the whole transportation thing in Boston is just really iffy and they didn't wanna miss me at the end. But I got a text saying they were gonna be mile 17 and that just gave me a really big boost knowing it was coming. Um, I think I just really was in a zone and very focused on, um, yeah, just staying consistent. And I was keeping an eye on my pace. I was hanging out around, I think, kind of that 810, 811, 812, kind of right in there the entire time. And so then big boost. I think I ran a really good mile, that 16 to 17. I think there's a pretty good downhill. There's an uphill somewhere in there as well. And then a downhill, I'm trying to think, I mean, that's where the Newton Hills are starting. They were in Newton. So came up and I saw them at mile 17 and it just gave me the biggest smile, the biggest boost. And And that I felt is like kind of when the race really started for me. At this point, I knew that, you know, it was going to get really tough. The hills were coming. <clears throat> the funny thing about the Newton Hills is there's only supposed to be four. And so I was like, okay, well, I'm going to count them. One, two, three, four. So then I'll break it up and then I'll just feel like, okay, one is done. Now I have three. Okay, so I did that. And when I got to four, I'm like, okay, we did not get to Heartbreak Hill yet. And then I'm counting five and then counting six. Finally, at seven, we were at Heartbreak Hill. So I don't know. There's obviously little hills within those big hills that I was counting that were not actually considered the four of the bigger Newton Hills. So it was just kind of funny. So my whole thing with going up the Newton Hills was this is going to be completely effort-based. I will not look at my watch because I know if I look at my watch, I'm just going to get discouraged because going by effort up a hill that you need to be going slower, right? So I, I knew my pace was going to be dropping. And so I just told myself, I want to keep the same effort I've been doing. The race is going to start at the top of Heartbreak Hill. That's when I can start pushing super hard. So certainly it was still hard going up those hills, but I needed to have, you know, as much as I could give afterwards. And so stopped looking at my watch. And when we got to the top of Heartbreak Hill, I yelled, let's go. And the funny thing, at the top of Heartbreak Hill, there's a sign, but then you go down the hill and there's like another little hill right after that. It's not like it's just all downhill again. I mean, and that's when I kind of was like, this is not CIM. This is absolutely no CIM whatsoever. They're both rolling courses. They're both net downhill. The thing about CIM is that basically from like halfway to maybe a little farther, it's it's a lot downhill with tiny little rollers, maybe, whereas there's these huge hills with Boston from 16 to 21, and it really does take a toll on you. I mean, looking back, thinking that I could one PR and get a sub 330, you know, I knew it was a stretch goal. I knew it was super lofty. In that moment, I think I was like, okay, that was a major stretch goal. This isn't really the race to necessarily try to go for 330. That's okay. Um, I just want to get the best absolute time that I can. That was really all I cared about and run my my hardest race ever. That's what I wanted. So then at that point, I look at my watch and my only goal at that point was just run faster than that, run as hard as you can, start getting that pace down. Um, and also my watch was off. I was like from all the weaving I had done before. So that is a good learning lesson, but it was very off, and so I knew my pace was slower than what my watch said because um, it wasn't clicking right on with when I would pass the mile markers. Basically, then I would say I was running at maybe a seven rate of perceived exertion. Uh, I definitely, it was like that uncomfortable, uncomfortably hard uh, moving, you know, tempo pace type feeling. 
uh, and then moving kind of up to that eight, but I didn't want to go up to that nine, 10 feeling yet um, that I was going to save that for those last couple miles because, you know, 5.2 is a lot at the end of a marathon and you still don't really know what's going to happen. But I was pushing hard. It felt hard, um, especially, you know, in my body, not in my lungs. That was fine. In fact, that was really fine the entire time. It was like my body couldn't keep up with my lungs. The hills definitely did a number on my legs. So my calves were really cramping at this point. And that's when I kind of felt this fear of like, they felt like they could lock up at any time. And you see people in marathons where they're completely locked up. They cannot walk um, and they can't even make it to the finish line because they can't walk. Like if I cramped up so much, you know, that I could walk, that's one thing. But to cramp up and not make it to the finish line, I definitely had that fear in my mind. It really was that close. That is what it felt like. Um, it was uncomfortable to run, but it didn't hurt. It was more just like, okay, I got to keep these legs moving. I got to keep the electrolytes in me. I got to keep drinking water. You know, I'm going to be fine. So I just kept going. So then with about mile 24, like 2.2 to go, that is when I'm like, let's go. So in an Instagram post in the couple days before, I had seen someone write the words, let yourself be incredible. And that had been my mantra going into the race. I wrote it on my arm along with my kids' names. They were, that's who I was running for. And that's, this is, these are the moments where I was saying to myself, let yourself be incredible. And when my calves are cramping, I'm saying to myself, okay, you can either run with fear or you can run fearlessly knowing that you gave it all you had. And that's really what I was doing in those moments. You know, I wanted to cross that line knowing I did everything I absolutely could. And that is when I just went for it. Um, I was saying, let's effing go. Like that was what I was saying in my head, just effing go. Like, um, because yeah, it's hard. You have to convince yourself to keep going. You have to convince yourself to keep pushing that pace down. Um, I saw that sit go sign and just like people say, you see it and you still have such a long ways to go, it feels like, but the crowds at this point are super heavy. The spectators were so awesome the entire way. I think just seeing the people's pride for this race, the people of Boston, um, how much they love this race and treat you like a celebrity. I mean, that is really when you felt it in that moment how how special it was to be there. Um, and that's just when I really kind of feeling sort of emotional, but being like, hey, you can't cry because then you can't breathe. Uh, and then I got to a mile and that is really when I said, give this, you know, everything you have, it's gonna hurt. You're gonna wanna throw up. And that is how I felt. And then all of a sudden, we're turning right on Hereford Street. And that is like a little hill when you turn, but it's pretty short. And then there's Boylston and you're turning left on Boylston. The one thing I was thinking turning left on Boylston was like, oh, the finish line seems so much farther away than I imagined that it would be. You're running down that street, what seems like forever. That's when I was kind of like, I'm gonna get under 337. That's where I'm at, 337. But it was just farther than I realized. Um, I knew I was running hard. I was running like, I think 750 or something pace at that point, the, the fastest mile of the entire race. Um, and I had done some eights, uh, just under eights, but that was definitely by far the fastest. And just the crowds at that point carry you. Um, I found out later that my family was there like yelling for me, but they were on the right-hand side. I was on the left-hand side, so I didn't even hear them. And watching the video now, you realize how loud it truly was. There she is. There she is, she's on the other side. that moment eyes on the finish line and you just want to get there um and so I ended up crossing at 3 37 29 was my time raising my hands in the air it was such an amazing feeling after all this time going for it to finally be there made sure I had asked some people to take some pictures at the finish line and then stopped and got the medal put around my neck. Uh, it was just such an awesome feeling. Got to get my medal. Thank you. I got it. You know, it's not.
not just about the medal. It's about all of the time and energy and hard work it took to get there, as well as my family supporting me through all of this. They've always been there for me and no matter what, supported me in this crazy journey of mine. So no, I did not meet my 3.30 time goal and I don't care at all. All I wanted was to just give it everything I had. It was not my fastest marathon, but it is by far my proudest effort. I worked incredibly hard in that race. It was a harder course than I could have imagined. Extremely humbling, even with the beautiful weather. I can't imagine doing that on a tough weather day. But um, I also qualified for Boston again. So I was about, I was 2.31 under the Boston qualifying time for my age group. So super excited about that. I read that 39% of runners at Boston Marathon qualify for Boston, which yes, that's a big number, but every 80% of the runners who run there had to qualify. So uh, only half of those 80% qualified so i i feel really really good about that and just thrilled and i beat my bib number uh by like six thousand numbers i think because you're placed with bib number you're placed in order of your time and so beating your bib means you kind of did better than your overall place so felt ecstatic about that um i just squeezed into the top half of the entire field um, in terms of ranking, and then I was 635th out of 1,635 women in the age 40 to 44 age group. So uh, yeah, and at the end, you know, I walked, I was shivering, it, it got really windy, and actually there was a headwind during, during the race as well, somewhat uh, hard at some points, but welcomed at some points because it actually got pretty warm out there. Um, but then it was cold afterwards and found my family and just hugged them. And it was such an amazing moment. And I was just honestly feeling different feelings, uh, bittersweet that it was over, but also happy that it was over. <laughs> It's a memory I'll always keep. And I just want to tell you guys, if you have a dream, go after it. Even if you know it's lofty, even if you know it's hard, keep going for it because you'll get there as long as you're willing to put in the work. And that's kind of how I felt in that moment. Um, same thing with 3.30 time goal. I'm not letting that go. Uh, it's something that I still want to achieve and work on. But for now, I'm just super, super happy and thrilled and going to take a little downtime for sure from marathon training it's definitely what i need and uh focus on helping you guys out on this youtube channel and what you need so if you have certain ideas let me know thanks for being on this journey with me guys i appreciate it so much the support was felt all along the way and thank you from the bottom of my heart and i will talk to you guys soon